At the conclusion of war in Europe in May of 1945, Germany had one of its two premier ocean liners from the 1920s left afloat, and this was the SS Europa. The 50,000-ton ocean liner was seized by the United States and would be used to transport troops back to North America, and the New York Times would dub it the biggest prize of war in shipping history. The question of what the United States intended to do with Europa was a big question. Throughout the rest of 1945 and into 1946, the United States would conduct a series of surveys on the ship's hull and systems to judge whether it was worth repairing to its full glory or selling it off for scrap. The report was not favorable. In May of 1946, the United States claimed that no one in the United States wanted the ship. The vessel was rushed to completion in 1928 and 1929. Its design was enlarged during construction, as initially it was just supposed to be 35,000 tons and 775 feet long, where it ended up as being 50,000 tons and 936 feet long, and this showed issues in the ship's design, with serious electrical faults causing major fire hazards, and the hull suffered from major cracking within three years of entering service. Couple its operational history prior to World War II with it being neglected throughout World War II, the ship's condition was poor, and refurbishing it would cost roughly $15 million, and the United States had no intention of dishing that out. However, France was interested in the vessel, as Normandy was judged to cost $30 million to fix up, so paying half the price for a nation that was economically destroyed seemed like a reasonable deal, and so France ended up purchasing Europa and refurbishing it into Liberty. Prior to entering World War II, the United States was interested in constructing a large, fast ocean liner of its own, and preliminary designs were conducted in 1940, and would slightly carry on throughout the war. However, they were mostly on the back burner, and the project would not officially restart until the 26th of March, 1946. During World War I, large ocean liners like Mauritania, Aquitania, and Olympic were capable of transporting large amounts of troops in relatively quick amounts of time, and so the United States started to take interest in building liners for this functionality during war, and during World War II, even larger and faster liners like Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth had solidified this idea even further, which led to the project's revival in 1946. The project would be led by William Francis Gibbs of Gibbs and Cox, whom was a renowned ship designer for his time period. Gibbs is credited with having designed roughly 5,500 ships, and it's estimated that 70% of the ships used by the United States Navy in World War II were designed by him. However, his passion did not necessarily lie in warships, transports, and cargo liners, as he had always had a soft spot for the gigantic ocean liners of the 1910s and 20s, but he took note that the United States was not one of the operators of these vessels. So to say that this was a passion project would be an understatement. Gibbs was going to throw everything he had into designing the most perfect ocean liner he could think of. Gibbs proposed the project to the Maritime Commission in March of 1946, which the Maritime Commission was a branch of the United States government that regulated ship design and funding. The Maritime Commission was happy to approve the project, if certain stipulations could be met in the design, Namely, the vessel needed to have a high, unrivaled speed, and it needed to be capable of carrying up to 15,000 troops in the event of World War III. In return, the government would pay for a fraction of the ship's construction cost, because they were going to be a partial owner. The United States would not be the only ship to come out of these proposals, as the United States government was interested in constructing a series of ocean liners that could be quickly converted into troop transports, and so they would order one large liner, which was the primary project, two medium-sized liners, which were completed in 1951 as the Independence and Constitution, along with three cargo ships. With approval having been attained, work would commence at the Gibson Cox offices in Lower Manhattan, New York State, where the plans would be drafted up, then sent to Newport News Shipbuilding, who was the intended builder, and then from there they would be sent to the Maritime Commission, who would either approve or deny plans. Nearly 150,000 pounds of paper would be used in preliminary designs, and several hundred models were constructed at Newport New Shipyard in order to test various types of hulls for the effects of hydrodynamics 
and aerodynamics to get the most speed out of the vessel. Obviously, the propulsion system would play a major role in getting the ship at high speeds, coupled with the aerodynamics and hydrodynamics on the hull. For the propulsion system, the Iowa-class battleship was used as the foundation, since those vessels produced 210,000 shaft horsepower, producing 33 knots, making the world's fastest battleships. The Iowa-class battleships would have their turbines supplied by General Electric, but for the new project, Gibbs and Cox went to the Westinghouse Electric Corporation for a new set of turbines of a similar design. Babcock and Wilcox, a major producer of boilers at the time, would supply the boilers for the Iowa-class battleships, and the new ocean liner would utilize the same company with similar boilers being installed. The difference between the boilers on the Iowa and the new ocean liner was the steam pressure they would operate at. Aboard the Iowa, they ran at roughly 600 psi. For the new ocean liner, they were intended to operate up to 1,000 psi. With the updated propulsion system, the vessel was rated to operate at upwards of 247,000 shaft horsepower, which was an unseen number aboard an ocean liner. In order to meet the requirement of carrying upwards of 15,000 troops during war, and to have a sizable amount of passengers while in standard service, the vessel would be given 12 passenger decks. With a rough design in mind, a model was constructed of the vessel and was presented in early April of 1948, and the design was approved on the 5th of April. With approval having been attained, the process of creating working plans could begin, and this would also include continued testing with various models to refine the shape of the hull. This phase would also see the introduction of another major player, Dorothy Markwald, whom would be the interior architect. She had designed the interiors for the SS America in the 1930s, and was being utilized once again for the Vermeer liner, but this time there was a new design requirement. The vessel's interiors had to be flame-proof. The United States and the United States Lines, whom would be the peacetime operator, had no intention of letting the new ocean liner catch on fire and burn at port, like Normandy. When all was said and done, the vessel was 99.9% .9 fireproof, because you gotta leave that 0.1% available, just in case there was something flammable. The only wood that would be utilized in the ship would be for its grand pianos, which were made of a special mahogany that were tested by actually pouring petrol on them and lighting both of them on fire, just to make sure they wouldn't burn, and they didn't. With the general arrangement plans having been completed, the vessel was rated to carry 3,101 people during peacetime operations, with 2,008 being the passengers, while the rest were the crew. The vessel's general dimensions would be 990 feet long, 101 feet at its widest, so it could still fit through the Panama Canal just in case, and it would have a draft of 31 feet. The ship's superstructure would be constructed using 2,000 tons of aluminum, which was an unseen number used on previous vessels. This would help keep the gross register tonnage down to 53,329 tons. When all was said and done, it was calculated that the vessel would operate at 35 knots standard, while it was capable of roughly 45 knots. The final contract for construction was signed with Newport News Shipbuilding on the 3rd of May, 1949, and in early 1950, 400 plans were presented to the shipyard, which would be turned into roughly 5,000 working plans for construction. William Gibbs would say, about 50% of the maritime engineering brains of the country have been applied to this vessel. And on the 8th of February, 1950, they were placed to the test when the keel was finally laid. The ship would be constructed in the number 10 slipway of the Newport News shipyard, which was only 960 feet long, so the ocean liner was projected to be slightly longer than this, so the bow and stern slightly hung off the ends. It's worth noting that slipway number 10 was actually a graving dock. This would hide the lower hull from prying eyes, since the new ocean liner was a classified project, meaning the hull form was top secret. By the end of 1950, the hull was largely completed, and 50% of the superstructure was in place. And by May of 1951, the two funnels were installed. Launching day was quickly approaching, and a name had yet to be decided on. Some of the initial ideas that popped around the room were Columbia, Hudson, Mayflower, New York, and the proposal of American Engineer was even thrown forward. However, none of these would stick. 
the United States Navy was constructing an aircraft carrier under the name of United States. However, the project was cancelled during construction, and the name found itself available. Since the new ocean liner was supposed to be the premier liner of the United States lines, and it was going to represent the United States as a country, the United States was a fitting name, and on the 23rd of June, 1951, when the ship was launched, it was officially named United States. The ship still had roughly one more year worth of construction time left, as it underwent the fitting out stage and would undergo sea trials. And at the time, it was claimed the ship was only capable of 158,000 horsepower, where of course, since documents have been declassified, we know it was over 240,000 shaft horsepower. During sea trials, the ship had a top speed of 43 knots, and in reverse, it was capable of 20 knots, which was as fast as most vessels going forward. On the 22nd of June, 1952, the ship was officially completed and was finally handed over to the United States lines so it could begin its service life, which would be successful for the first decade. With that having been said, there is nothing more to add on to this topic for today. So, if you have learned something new, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.